Hello all, welcome to this week's edition of the Pinkin.com Norwich City podcast in association with Future Radio 107.8 FM as we look back on a fairly depressing 4-0 defeat at Carrow Road to none less than the Harlem Globetrotters who are Manchester City. Pep Guardiola's superstars. He didn't even need them all. He left Kevin De Bruyne and a few other players, Jao Cancelo, on the bench. But they still won 4 0, hit the post, had one disallowed, kept Dangus Gun busy. Uh, so, as much as dissecting what went wrong for Norwich in that game, because I think we're actually going to be able to throw a bit of a positive light on that, I think it's almost going to be looking at the disparity within the Premier League and just highlighting the difficulties for a self-funding club like Norwich trying to compete with a club who has spent hundreds and hundreds of millions to construct a fantastic squad. Dave Freezer here alongside Connor Southwell and Paddy Davitt in the aftermath of that 4-0 defeat. Uh, Pad, let me throw a few stats at you as we kick off. Manchester City had 72% of possession, 22 shots, 9 of them on target. Uh, 12 corners, um, Norwich had to make 29 clearances, so I think uh, they were probably worth their three points. Yeah, I think we'll probably give them the three points on the evidence. I'm surprised it's as low as 72% possession, it felt a lot more than that, um, if that <laughs> is possible. Uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately, we felt that there is a, the league table doesn't lie. The league table tells you there's a golfing class and quality, and, and that was evident in this encounter even though they left some of their biggest hitters in reserve which only underlines how big that golf is and uh yeah maybe that's a broader debate about the premier league it is essentially they're in the same division as man city but different footballing planet they're inhabiting to the one norwich are on and um and that was that was pretty evident tonight after uh you know reasonably encouraging first half but well, I mean, as Dean Smith rightly said, you know, they go in 1-0 up Raheem Sterling, but it was the Phil Foden goal three minutes after the break. That was the killer for him. He said it just deflated everybody. He felt the atmosphere got sucked out of the stadium. And yeah. and really then, for me, I'd, I'd agree, after that point, what we saw was essentially a glorified training exercise. And uh, that in itself tells you where, where the, the levels are in this league, that, that they were so dominant um, and so many gears yet to go that they didn't need to go to like we said on the walk back to the office here i mean if it was a champions league final tomorrow then kevin de bruyne would be in that side Cancelo would be in that side you know laporte would be in that side and maybe one or two others not even talking about Grealish, who wasn't available to tonight for injury so it's frankly ridiculous but it's not just norwich and man city it's the premier league of man city because that result has put them 12 points clear of their nearest challenges were liverpool who as we record play on sunday at burnley for them to be 12 points clear of the rest of the Premier League is just, well, quite rightly, you know, there's, there's debates to be had now. Are they, are they the best Premier League side ever? Um, and you'd probably be hard-pressed to, to disagree. So, no disgrace for Norwich in losing to that level of opposition. But to give him his due, Dean Smith will get into it, I'm sure. But he felt, you know, they made it too easy. There was there was, there was was sloppy elements to the goals from a Norwich perspective. Um and that's where the frustration was for him and the disappointment is the phrase he used that as good as they are you know i think his words were something along the line of you could take a six nil if they produced wonderful goals and wonderful football it wasn't that it was man city in cruise control really and yet they were still so so far ahead of norwich but that's where we are in 2022 in the premier league yeah maybe we should have just let them all go off and have the Super League <laughs> because that's, um, you know, mixing with a totally different class. I mean, they were great to watch. I did enjoy watching some of the football. Just every pass is so sharp and accurate and the way they move the ball and the way they just rotate themselves tactically. And they were um, they were a bit of a joy to watch and some real, real class out there. But I think it's certainly my view, Connor. I don't know if you agree that Norwich played a lot better than they did in the 5-0 defeat away from home. And if you look at those goals, you know, Gunn saves the penalty, but then they managed to turn it in. Hanley very nearly stops the second one. The first one, Max really should have been clearing it. You know, they were... It's maybe, you know, for everybody else in the Premier League, they'll just look at the score and be like, oh, Man City beat Norwich 4-0. Shock. <laughs> but for those of us that were in the stadium, it, it feels like they were competitive to a degree and they certainly did put the effort in didn't they 
Yeah, I'd, I'd take the first half really as, uh, as the positive from an Norwich perspective. I think you park the second because the way Manchester City play, as, as Pad said, as you said there, it's, it's suffocating. They, they don't concede throw-ins. There are no breaks in plays. You don't foul them because you can't get close to them when they're in possession. It's... Um, you know they they lure you in and then kind of suck the life out of you. It's 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 almost like um it's almost like they're a bit of a vampire to to be honest. And and it's it's incredibly difficult to do anything but to sit there and admire them um, because of the way they play. I think if you were trying to get someone to code uh, a perfect football team or as close to a perfect football team as possible, you'd end up with that Manchester City side. That's essentially what Pep Guardiola has done. And um, you're right. It's a different. It's a different stratosphere to where Norwich City are. I mean, the, the way they. I mean, Norwich forced them out wide. That was the game plan. They wanted to get them into crossing positions, but the way they then overloaded the sides. I mean, it was it was problem solving. Um, you know, the best I've I, I've probably seen at Carrow Road. To be honest, it was uh, it was relentless, and I think it's it's really difficult to kind of break down. And I know Smith will will look at the goals individually, but just in terms of the golf, it's it's very difficult. So I think for us to sit here and go forty five minutes where they were really competitive, where they hit the post, where they had some openings, um, Kenny McLean shot as well. I think. Mm when he sits down and reflects tonight, he'll be very disappointed that he didn't do better with that. And these are key moments in those games because when the chances present themselves as they did for Norwich City in the first half, you have to take them because if not, even um, being slightly off it or making a minor mistake and you get punished by by that team. So I think they will have, I think they will have learned a lot. And uh, and really, um, I, I arrived at Carrow Road today thinking if, if they could just emerge, park the result a little bit, if they could just emerge with a positive and, and it wasn't a performance that completely squashed their momentum and maybe their, their newfound confidence, I suppose, as well from, from recent weeks, that would be, that would kind of be the ideal situation. I think they have come out with that. I think they were competitive for uh, 45 minutes and the second half, I think, was just a reflection of how well Manchester City played, how good their players are, the golf between the squad, but also how fatigued Norwich are. There's, there's nothing harder as, as as a player i mean i've played for some rubbish football teams it's really difficult when uh, you haven't got the ball to go and to go and chase and to go and press and to defend constantly it's it's a lot easier to to make the ball do the work and that's what they do so well they they just grind teams down and eventually their quality tells and i thought that was the case today so yeah i mean for norwich you kind of have to look at this game and the one against liverpool next week in isolation and uh, and i think it's hard to really analyze it with any depth because of the the difference in quality. I mean, it's it's almost like a a top two, and then everyone else really. And 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 you know, these games aren't going to be what keep Norwich City in the Premier League. It's um, these are the games that you get promoted for, and you want to test yourself against. Uh, and I felt for forty five minutes, they they did that pretty well. Right, let's go back to the start a little bit then. Um, um, City, Manchester City, should I say, <laughs> um, made five changes. Um, Kyle Walker, Nathan Ake, Zinchenko, Fernandinho, Gundogan, every single one of which, of course, would be in the Norwich starting lineup. They all came in, and John Stones, Imeric Laporte, Joao Cancelo, Rodri, and Kevin De Bruyne, who didn't even need to come onto the pitch. They all dropped to the bench. So, um, pretty decent uh, players to be able to bring in. They'd beaten Brentford 2-0 on, on Wednesday night, and, and Pep decided to rotate it because they've got a big game in Portugal Tuesday night in the Champions League against Sporting. Um, but from a Norwich point of view, it's back to the 4-3-3. Uh, the two changes were Pojeta on the bench, Ida missing out. There's a, a bit of a concern there. He's got a, a bit of a knee injury where he's got to go for a, for a scan. They're hoping that it's not going to be anything major, but we'll have to wait and see how that is, maybe even until the uh, pre-Liverpool press conference on Friday. Uh, coming in, Josh Sargent back from his... Uh, illness, absence, and Billy Gilmore back into midfield. So that element of of stuff then, Pad uh, Gilmore coming in, Sergeant. What, what did you make of the of the team as a, as a whole? Well, I mean, Sergeant, you know, at Watford, that was the, that was the you know that was the probably the best given he scored the goals. It's probably simplistic to say, but I, th I just think all round, you know, that was that was a major step forward and. I don't think I don't think against this level of opposition, as Connor pointed out, you can really draw any really hard and fast conclusions. But you know, he, he I mean, my mind goes back to the third goal um, where he's failed to get the run with Diaz, who's got the header back across goal, and Sterling's had a very simple opportunity, and you know that was a key error. And and I, I think him and Aaron's as a pair, they didn't really work. Um, to the to the effective level, I'm sure Smith would have required you know the the second goal, the killer second goal, as Smith said after the game. They'd spoken about Man City's desire to kind of move full backs out of the way, and then 
that vacant space is attacked by the likes of a Fernandinho or a Gundogan, as as it turned out for that goal. And you know, you'd you'd have, you'd have liked to have thought Sargent would have been able to supplement Aaron's and 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 the first half as as much as Norwich were in the game. It was alarming the amount of overloads they worked down the Norwich right, and uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think Sargent really offered. Um, probably what Dean Smith would have hoped for without the ball and of course Aaron's was withdrawn in the second half there didn't seem to be any injury there so that kind of tells you you know what he thought of maybe Max's display tonight so Gilmore yeah one or two one or two decent touches you know he's he's in and around very good players and you, you could see why in that company he looks quite comfortable really um, but in terms of affecting the game and it you know again it's Man City so it probably didn't really it's unfair to judge him too much, but um, you know I don't think he really left a huge impression on the game. I thought of all the midfielders, McLean probably offered more, certainly physically and without the, against the ball and his work rate and endeavour. Um, but of course, you know that's that should be a given. Um, you're looking for a little bit more, certainly at this level. And uh, yeah, I mean ultimately, yeah, the, ultimately I think it wasn't really about any individuals for Norwich it's just a collective kind of way short of what's required to compete at that end of the division but ultimately that isn't what it's about for Norwich that won't define their season what happened against Man City or Liverpool next week um, you just hope that they emerge the other side of the Liverpool game for what are massive games in the league against Southampton Brentford and Leeds um, that they haven't took too much of a hit in terms of their self-belief in terms of the confidence in terms of the momentum um, but you know that's another four goals to a, a goal difference which was alarmingly negative so you know that doesn't help them in that regard but could have been worse could have been worse if Man City took more of their chances but yeah no I, I just think tonight you know it didn't really probably didn't really matter what Dean Smith did tactically um, in terms of the setup. I, I think Man City would have found a way because yeah. You know that's, that's a team who ultimately have lost two Premier League games and only dropped one point, two points to Southampton since God knows when. It's a ridiculous run of form. Um, yeah, they've won fourteen and drawn one of the last yeah. fifteen now, haven't they? So yeah, so you know, but I think I think I think as I say, for me, it's not so much about this week. It's not so much about next week. It's the three after that. I think that will go a long way to deciding mm. Norwich's status. And in those three games, certainly Sargent, I think, will prove his worth as he did. You know, as I said, at the Watford game. Yeah, I I agree, and clearly with uh, the games in hand that the other teams have around them, they've got to get a decent amount of points from those three games as well. And it could be easy, you know. Southampton and Leeds are both away, but the Brentford home game, of course, is huge. Um, plenty of chat about Max Aarons. Um, obviously, there's a bit of a mistake there, and he gave away the penalty against Palace, which fortunately Zaha missed. Um, where do you stand on him? Because I think. Zaha on the whole he coped with really well but then there was some bad moments and then today uh, certainly the first half I thought he was doing pretty well against Sterling and then it's sort of gone a bit sour isn't it so Sam Byron comes on in the in the 63rd minute I wondered whether maybe Smith was going to put him on the right of a back three and, and use Max as a as a wing back because I thought Sargent was already looking pretty knackered by that point but yeah Max is almost sort of caught between a rock and a hard place at the moment yeah i think i think there's i think there's mitigation behind that performance as uh, as paddy said the, the the sheer amount of overloads that man city were creating it was essentially not just defending against raheem sterling but against zinchenko and against the supporting midfielder at times so it was essentially three men i think it's it's incredibly difficult as a fullback to play against Manchester City and to defend against Manchester City. My mind goes back to the Etihad and uh, and Dimitris Yunulis was pulled at half time for almost exactly the same thing. But on the left on the left side, um, where, where Man City were very good that day in terms of working overloads and uh, and and being really difficult with, with some of their movements. So. I, I wouldn't necessarily hammer Max Aarons for that performance. I thought it was poor by all accounts and maybe it doesn't help that everyone sets such high standards for him because we all know the ability and potential that he has. He's Mr. Consistent. Um, he, I, I think even in, in recent weeks, I thought at Watford he, he was very good and went under the radar as well. So um, I think you can maybe dismiss it in isolation as uh, him playing against a very good opponent and Raheem Sterling doesn't usually get in the Manchester City team, by the way. So um, the fact that he he, t he turns up at Carrow Road and, and, and scores a hat-trick, I think you, you can't read too much into it. I think it was going to be very difficult for, for any 
player in in that position. Um, it, any right back in the Premier League, I think, would have struggled because, as we said, I, I didn't think Sargent contributed defensively um, to the standard that he usually has. Um, the way Manchester City play, the way they set up tactically, it's it, it's incredibly difficult. So, I I, th I think he can probably dismiss it as a one off. I think Norwich can probably dismiss it as a one off, but. Um, yeah, I think considering the level of performance that we're used to seeing from him, it was uh, it was a disappointing night, and we know how high he aims to to be with his performances. So I think ultimately he's honest enough, and will reflect in the same way. Um, and of course, he he has a, a an equally difficult weekend next. I'm trying to think it's it's Mane on the left, isn't it, or is it Salah usually for, on the left? For, uh, yeah, Mane left. Ball. I think. Yeah. yeah so uh, I mean, to go from one week defending against Raheem Sterling to Sadio Mane, different challenges, but um, that's that's ultimately the level he wants to get to. Yeah. So, um, yeah, another big challenge for him next week and he's got another opportunity to put it right, of course, if he's uh, if he's selected. And if it's not Mane, it's probably Diogo Yota. <laughs> yeah, Harvey Elliott. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's plenty of, plenty of options. Uh, the, who's the, the new lad as well? Diaz, uh, is it? Diaz. Yeah, yeah. yeah Luis Diaz. So. Um, anyway, we'll park that for the moment. Um, I'm going to uh, bring you a bit of um, audio from uh, our post-match chat with Billy Gilmore in just a minute. But just to um, tee that up really, Pad, the uh, other sub in the 63rd minute was Mateus Norman coming on for Lise Malou. And... What do you make of the sort of Norman situation based on what Dean Smith sort of said pre-game? Is there almost an element of them uh, just being patient, knowing that Norman really, you need him for the, those three games we're talking about, Southampton, Brentford, Leeds, more than you do these games, really? Yeah, that's it. Nail on head. Um, Post-match as well, put it to Dean Smith um, and said he, he, I think his words were along the lines of he was extremely tempted to start him tonight, right. but with the bigger picture in mind that you alluded to, the uh, he just heard on the side of caution. But um, I think he also finished off that post-match with he will be a big player for Norwich for what remains of the season. So I, I think it's it's less will Norman start, it's when he starts and then who actually plays around him. I think, I think if he stays fit from now on, um, and if you take Dean Smith at what he's said after the game, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Liverpool is the start now of, of him being in the side as a permanent feature with the caveat that there's no more injury issues. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it, while it's frustrating because, you know, you'd have liked to have seen him out there from the start against Man City, I think um, I think that's maybe where Dean Smith's experience has come into play. And, you know, heaven forbid he'd have played from the start tonight and, and uh, suffered any sort of relapse and then... He's not available for Southampton, Brentford, Leeds, and uh, let's be honest, he's going to probably have a more of an impact in those three games, you would hope, if he can get anywhere close to his levels pre-injury uh, than he would have done against the likes of Man City and Liverpool. So, yeah, it, uh, it can't come a moment too soon, I think, because there's no doubt he immeasurably improves Norwich's midfield in the centre of the park or when he's on the pitch. Absolutely. Right, let's hear a bit from Chelsea Loney, Billy Gilmore then. Did that timeout injured give you a little bit of a time to sort of absorb that first six months and really think about what you'd learned in, in, in those games? Yeah, of course it was, it was a test and a different manager. They didn't really see much of me, but for me, I'm out here, I'm going to get the most out of this season. Uh, and I'm hoping, I'm sure my teammates, my, my teammates got fully, I've got fully trust in them. And I will continue this way, continue on the front foot and pick points up. Fitness-wise, are you feeling right? Is it sort of the heel? Yeah, I mean, it feels good. Yeah. I'm, I'm good. Out, uh, I feel good back from injury and playing, so that's good. I'm good on back. Good. Uh, Pierre played the slightly deeper role today, didn't he? Tactically, where do you sort of see your game is at at the moment? You think sort of playing on the sort of right nominally as you were today. Does that give you a little bit more time to pick your passes and things like that? For me, I'm happy to play anywhere in the midfield. I've said that multiple times where I know what position I need to play if I get asked to play the deeper, the higher role. Um, on my box to box midfield, I'm happy to play anywhere. So I'll go out there, do a job for the team, for myself, and I know exactly what I need to play, and especially for the manager. If you compare this game to the 5-0 away from home, it feels like you played a lot better today than in that game, but they, they had so many chances. That, the disparity between the big clubs and, and, and the clubs that obviously Norwich have come up from the championship and stuff, it, it is a big gap, isn't it? Yeah, of course, it's Manchester City are one of the best teams in the world, we know that. That's why they're at the top and we're at the bottom, but at the same time, we put in a right test today. Of course, it's, the, score, the score doesn't say that, but 
the way one nil at half time we think we had a chance to come back out early goal kills us mm. but we digged in we showed opportunities had some opportunities to go from corners set places and that's where we thought we could get them that's where we thought we were most vulnerable on the counter attacks as well but we know next week as well Anfield's going to be a tough tough test so we go there and go with the same mindset and a battle good stuff all right thank you Billy. Thanks thanks for your time. Time. we live norwich city the builder the passion the drama the last minute winners the debate that's why we've created pink and plus the app that takes you beyond the headlines. With exclusive columns, blogs, podcasts and videos, we've got you covered. Subscribe today. Pink and Plus. Stay ahead of the game. Download now on the App Store and on Google Play. Yes, Pink and Plus. I'm sure you've heard us talking about it plenty. Um, there is... Uh, a competition running at the moment. If you haven't already taken the plunge for one ninety nine a month, uh, which we, um, in our humble opinion, think is great great value for what you're getting. Um, if you think that the EDP is a pound a day, uh, just two quid for the month, and you get all the video, the audio, everything uh, in there. And uh, we're really pleased with the actual app itself. Um, but yeah, we've got a competition running at the moment for um, a signed Josh Sargent shirt. So um, if you haven't already checked out Pink and Plus, then please do. Um, a few other issues in and around things as well um, from from sort of the pre-game press conference. There's been setbacks for Omabama Delhi and Rupp, haven't there? Um, Kabak again missing through illness today. Um, still not expecting, you know, maybe Krull, I suppose, sounds like he might be back for the Southampton game. Sorensen probably um, it's looking like start of next month at the earliest or something, isn't it? They're still not really putting a, a definite time frame on it. If Adam Eder also does end up being a bit of an extended one, then that, that's some, some pretty important options then being removed again, isn't it? Yeah, particularly at the top end of the pitch, I think. And, and it would be it would be a real shame for, for Adam Eder in particular because um, over the, well, in the, in the last month or, or so, since certain, definitely since the start, sort of turn of the year, we've probably seen some really good performances from him. Um, and it felt like a time where maybe for the first time in his Norwich City career, he was actually finding a rhythm and a momentum and a consistency. And, uh, you know, the fact that anyone, people were discussing whether it would be him or Timu Buki, I think, is is probably a, a mark of how... Uh, of how much he's, he's improved over the last month or so because that conversation certainly wasn't present before that point. It was always very much a case of um, Timu Puki and, uh, and that was it really. So that would be a significant blow and, and it would also be a significant blow to the fact that Norwich have, uh, have won games playing a 4-4-2. I mean, I don't know how they would go about doing that if Adam Eder is is on the sidelines for any significant period of time because they, they don't have enough another striker um, to fulfil that role unless, of course, they, they push Sargent up to, to play alongside Puki and uh, and maybe, I don't know, look to, to play someone else on the right. Um, but, you know, I think from, from what we've seen of Josh Sargent, particularly at Watford, his, his better performances have come there. So that would be a blow and uh, I think we all hope that's, that's not serious. Um, Lucas Rupp, again, I, I actually felt in, in some of Smith's early performances, he, he was very good. Um, and again, it seems to be an injury issue that, that's knocked him out of the side. And with his contract up in the summer, it, it kind of feels like we'll be we're sort of at the beginning of the end of his Norwich City career. And I suppose Andrew Omabamadeli is maybe in a different boat because with Zimmerman back, there's maybe, a, a, and obviously Kavak hopefully returning from illness soon, there's maybe less of a, a need for him to, or to really rush him back, sorry. So, um, yeah, it's it, it's a... It's a frustrating one, but um, you consider the situation they're in now, squad-wise, compared to where they were at the uh, at the start of the year, and, and they're in a significantly better place. I suppose the the only other one is is Tim Cruel, isn't it? And and if they can get him back before the end of the month, that would be massive, particularly before those that run of three games that we we spoke about, which is looking pretty decisive, I would say now for for Norwich City's survival in in the Premier League. Um, although I thought Angus was. Was very good tonight, actually. Um, I mean, it's it's almost chalk and cheese from the goalkeeper that we saw at the start of the season. Um, I feel the one we we saw maybe at Palace. He, he looks confident. He's making saves. He's um, he's he, he's vocal as well. Not as vocal as Tim Krul. I mean, he's not really that type of goalkeeper. But we well, certainly um, let Grant Handley know yes, when uh, he took yes. that ball off him, didn't he? <laughs> exactly. That's what I mean. And, and there are a couple of instances where he was marshalling his defence um, a lot better. So um, I, I don't think at, at the moment it's it's um, it's really as much of a concern as maybe we thought it was but you know clearly if Tim Krul's fit I think Tim Krul plays um, 
so yeah i mean hopefully we get to a place at the end of this month where crawl's back Sorensen's back because again i think his injury came at probably a, a, a time personally for him which wasn't great because he worked himself back in the team who he, he looked pretty decent i thought um in the opening 20 odd minutes it was at watford um there was one tackle in but i think it might have been the tackle that that um injured him actually that was that was pretty impressive but he he's out at a time where billy gilmore and matthias norman have come back so for him personally it's almost pushed him back down the the pecking order when you know many would have looked at it and felt that he had a really chance a real chance to stake his claim rather so um yeah i mean it's uh it will be good to have um you know, for, from Dean Smith's perspective, to have a full squad back because I think the evidence shows that when they do have a full squad and they have a healthy squad, that there's enough there for them to be competitive in the vast majority of games when they're when they're not playing Manchester City. Mm. Um, just sort of finally on the game, I suppose, Pad, what did you make of the penalty? Because <laughs> Dean Smith obviously was pretty unhappy about it. I mean. I, th I think I see it a bit like the one against Palace, really. That I thought Max was pretty unfortunate the way he sort of fell on uh, Mitchell, wasn't it? Tyrick Mitchell, yes. and the, the fullback had got forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and this one, I think you know Gibson just gives um, Delap a little bit of a shove, and then Hanley ends up sort of bundling him over. And Smith wasn't was pretty angry about it. I I think I think it was probably just about fair enough, but it just felt very harsh. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, Smith's comments. It, there was no sitting on the fence there. He got, he labelled it pathetic. That's what he told Andre Mariner, the referee, um, and went on to add it, it'd be another tick in the box for Mike Riley, the referee's czar. Um, mm. So he might be getting a tap on the shoulder for those comments, but uh, not happy, as he said. You know, at three nil down. You know, is it the type of uh, decision you need to give? Um, but then if you treat each incident in isolation, the scoreline probably doesn't come into it. Apparently, Andrew Moreno had said he wouldn't have given it for a shove, he wouldn't have given it for upper body contact, he gave it for lower body contact. So, you know, I kind of tend to agree with Smith. I think it's a very generous concession. But Hanley and Gibson have uh, not exactly dealt with that situation very well and, and have given the referee a decision to make. And, you know, he was in a good position as well, so I don't think there was any issues with his sight lines. Um, so I can see what's been given, as you rightly alluded to, the the one in midweek against Palace as well. You can see why they're given, and it's really about Norwich defenders being in the wrong position, having the wrong body shape, and you know, at this level, it's split seconds of a decision. And um, but you know, it didn't really materially alter the the course of the game, did it? But uh, yeah, there's no yeah. doubt Dean Smith adamant. Never a penalty, he said. I'll bounce it back to you as well because Connor's sort of touched on this a little bit already. But in terms of the Liverpool net game on Saturday and, and, and looking forward <laughs> to that one, as I'm sure we all are, <clears throat> the options feel a little bit limited. You know, it's probably not going to bring Zimmerman back in for, to a back three, are you, for such a difficult game? That would be a bit of a bit of a harsh call on the guy. Um, so I'm not r really sure what options there are to sort of make 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 them more solid. I guess it's just you've just got to try and show that sa same energy and determination and stuff that they were certainly trying to show in the first half. But you you just got you can't make an error, can you? You bet. Like the the thing that started it all, the mistake from Max, and then it sort of folds a bit from there. You basically just cannot lose your concentration for one second against the big boys, really, can you? Yeah, and you know it, it maybe underlines how good. Man City are currently that you look at that Liverpool team and you don't really see a weakness. You look at they've got some br brilliant players, absolutely brilliant mm. players, and not just the front three who get a lot of the, the headlines substituting up for Mino for Jota now. But um, yeah, I think it's it's going to be a different type of game because you know Liverpool don't necessarily set up to try and do what Man City do, which is uh, almost you know uh, make love to the ball basically. Um, they they uh, <laughs> yeah. They're much more counter-attacking, much more venomous, kind of co coax you in and then hit you again on the counter. So I think that might suit Norwich in terms of opponent because this this sort of stress that Dane Smith feel, feels that he's in at the minute where do you empty midfield with a an extra man in, in the attacking area so you carry a threat at that end of the pitch. But by doing that, you are conceding the, the middle ground probably matters more against a Man City than it would do a Liverpool, but then that would be a very brave call to go to Anfield and, and set up in a 4-4-2 uh, if they've got the personnel to do it, subject to the Eder out outcome. But, um, but 
but at least then, you know, I, I don't think they're going to be as penalised if they'd have gone that route today, then God knows what it could have ended up. Um, because they were, they didn't look like they didn't have enough men in the middle of the park as it was, but certainly if they'd have tried to keep four up the top end of the pitch, as Dean Smith rightly alluded to after the Watford game, you know, you can't do that against that type of side. But, you know, if Liverpool, which they don't, their, their MO isn't patiently building the play from the middle of the park through the third. So, you know, that might suit the Isle of Norwich a little bit better. But ultimately, I think what won't change is that they will they will have much fewer chances than Liverpool will and they need to be able to take them. They need to take one or two because if they don't, Liverpool will create a weight of chances and they have the attacking firepower that they will take a good proportion of those chances. So, you know, whatever he goes with tactically, um, that won't change. That In both boxes, they're going to have to be a lot better than they were today. Well, there we go. Back from the winter break with a three-game week. The 1-0 win at Wolves in the FA Cup. The 1-1 draw with Crystal Palace on Wednesday night. And then the 4-0 defeat to, well, we can probably just about call them the champions-elect. Certainly the reigning champions, the uh, runaway leaders. Uh, the billionaires are on their way to another bit of silverware. And it's probably not the only one they're going to win this uh, season. But, um, yeah, a busy week. and uh, The club have at least got a, a free week of... Uh, just being able to concentrate on training this week and preparing for that Liverpool game. And um, then they prepare for the Friday night trip to Southampton following that. So I can't imagine that they're going to spend too much time on the post-match debrief of this one because I don't think there's a great deal to learn. They they basically know they were outclassed and it was a bit of a mismatch and you just got to shake it off, move on and, and try and find some positivity. Um, but I think we'll leave it there. That's just about enough of a, of a debrief of a fairly depressing evening, unfortunately. There no epic roar at full time like uh, we got to experience in 2019 unfortunately that was a, a very uh, a special evening and uh, mad, uh, lightning couldn't strike twice as um, many people have, have wondered Pep Guardiola made sure it didn't um, he was pretty pretty lively in that first half wasn't he but um, thank you very much for listening um, the pod does come to you in a few, association with Future Radio 107.8 FM and do check out Pink and Plus if you've not already we'll keep everything flowing for you through this week as we build up to that game at Anfield which of course is followed 10 days later by one in the FA Cup fifth round at the same stadium um, which is going to be shown live on ITV um, so prime time an 8.15 kickoff which is a bit strange a bit worrying for us newspaper types who have a deadline to worry about when there's the potential for extra time and penalties but we will leave that for now thank you very much for listening we'll catch up with you soon